Introduction, uh, thank you for your patience. I'm sorry about that. Uh, before we begin, I want to uh, remind everybody that this talk will be on uh, the Computational Pathology uh, YouTube channel. And um, if you want to be, uh, if you're not on the, we have like a mailing list. Uh, if you're interested, you can email uh, any of us. Uh, I'm Jeffrey Fine. Uh, you can email Chakra uh, uh and we'll, we'll get you on the list. So uh, today it's a great uh, pleasure to introduce Dr. So McRoy. He is uh, an assistant professor in our department. He uh, mostly works with uh, molecular pathology and informatics currently. But he's also uh, an accomplished uh, GU pathologist with an interest in bladder. He, uh, he came to us from India. He uh, did his medical school in Mumbai at uh, Seth GS Medical College. And uh, he did uh, his first pathology residency uh, training in New Delhi at, uh, at Milana Azad uh, Medical College there. And uh, he came here, I want to say eight years ago, and he was just an outstanding resident. It was always a pleasure to work with him. And after doing his residency here, he stayed here and did two fellowships, one in, uh, one in uh, <laughs> he didn't do an informatics fellowship, but he did informatics throughout his time here. He did a molecular pathology fellowship and he did a um, GU pathology fellowship. And he is currently the uh, fellowship director for molecular pathology. And I thought that was, uh, that's a very good accomplishment to be running the fellowship program that you graduated from only three years previous. I thought that was really neat. And Dr. Roy is very academically active. He's written at least, uh, he's, he has 41 peer reviewed publications. He's nationally active in the, Ameri in the uh, Association for uh, Molecular Pathology, AMP. And, uh, and he's, he's uh, just a great individual, and I'm uh, very happy to introduce him here today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jeff, for that uh, kind introduction. And this, uh, no, that's, uh, <laughs> that's a lot. Uh, uh, so before I begin, I want to uh, thank Dr. Uh, you know, Bottler and uh, Dr. Burak for uh, the kind invitation and uh, sort of you know, allowing me to uh, present uh, some of the work that I've uh, you know, done in the uh, area of uh, genome sequencing. Um, and uh, so just before I begin, uh, you know, one of the things I would like to essentially mention is uh, uh, since this is uh, the data, is this work is still in progress and you know, especially the part of uh, validation and setting up some of the optimization parameters, I have purposefully not uh, mentioned those details in here because we're planning to put that in the uh, manuscript that is soon to be uh, you know, written up. Uh, so apologies for that if it, 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 it's a little less discreet, but I'll be you know, happy to answer questions that are important to that uh, once you know, the presentation is done. Okay, so with that, um, I have really you know, nothing to disclose here uh, in terms of conflicts of interest. Uh, so the talk essentially is going to go over uh, a, 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 you know, the, the overview of high throughput sequencing data in general, you know, how, how such kind of data is produced. And then I'm going to essentially delve into uh, my experience of uh, developing holigram sequencing bioinformatics pipeline. Uh, given uh, you know the time constraint, I have uh, not gotten specifically into presenting kind of the background literature. There is a lot out there, and there's and as you all are aware of, uh, this is one of the you know, hottest area in uh, personalized medicine, in cancer research, and it, you know it's it's I think it's a it's worth an hour of talk for itself to present all that. So I've essentially focused on my own personal experience um, in terms of you know dealing with the sequencing data, and but again as through Q and A, if you have any questions, you know we can certainly get into you know specific details. Uh, then I'm going to go over uh, the aspect of sequence data quality control as it pertains to the pipeline that's been developed. Uh, some aspects of compute resource and, uh, uh, and, and deployment of application, uh, which is sort of you know, part of the next steps of what I'm doing. And then really getting into uh, how uh, this initial work uh, allows to fork in different directions for uh, you know, uh, developing these individual aspects of, um, you know, of, uh, of this analysis. Uh, so, uh, starting with cancer, as you know, you know, many of you here in, here in the room are well aware of, it's, I think, one of the smartest disease that, you know, human beings have encountered uh, yet, and, and I think that's, it's, it's been known despite all the different, uh, you know, uh, efforts that has been done across, you know, across the world. Uh, it, it has been outsmarting us, and, and we've been and constantly learning about you know uh, the underlying biology. But and as we know, it's you know if if you talk about cancer, cancer essentially is an evolution. You know if you if you talk of biologic evolution, 
And if you cramp it into a small amount of time, from millions of years to a few years, that essentially what cancer does. And so it's and and really, uh, what that leads to is this very complex environment within and around the tumor that uh, you know that really helps uh, you know uh, cancers of you know of different types to propagate, to grow, to metastasize, you know, to essentially spread out uh, whenever they have that chance. And so, uh, how is that possible? And really, you know, what what the underlying thing, and you know, it's sort of like the you know the common knowledge now is cancer really is a genetic disease. And 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 what what we have learned so far, and 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 as you know, as the uh, the field of medicine progresses forward, uh, the field of genetic progresses forward, it's it's very clear in terms of you know how a cell essentially becomes independent and just you know uh, grows and creates and havoc. Um, and really, it's you know, it's it's uh, the fact that uh, one or more of you know of, of driver genes essentially uh, undergo some sort of genetic alteration, either mutation, copy number changes, change in dosage, structural rearrangement, that then uh, gives a survival advantage for you know for uh, you know upregulating the uh, you know the relevant downstream pathways or suppressing the relevant downstream pathways for uh, you know uh, survival, which is independent of growth factors and or uh, the ability to hide uh, you know a tumor from the immune system. And so, so that really what you know what that is. And so, if we understand that cancer is a genetic disease, then really what we want to look for is the underlying genetic alterations. And you know uh, the really where you know most studies start off is with you know starting off with the central dogma that's you know you start from uh, the dna sequence uh, and you start to look at okay what is the uh, result of the you know the initial um, transcription process that is giving you uh, you know either a coding or a non coding mrna and then uh, what are the different regulatory mechanisms that affect that and then subsequently the translation process and the various post translation modification that then makes the protein as to you know what it should be or in a case of uh, you know of a cancer an abnormal protein uh, so with the, with the exception of protein sequence if you look at uh, the level of you know rnas whether they're coding or non coding we look at you know dna uh, looking at either the exons the introns you know the the untranslated regions you know overall uh, you know the regulatory regions as we have been learning forward uh, it really uh, lends itself to uh, these different sequencing techniques that you know that uh, have uh, been developed uh, to to very thoroughly analyze that and and uh, so, you know I'll discuss in the next slides to uh, some of these um, uh, you know some of these sequencing uh, capabilities really help uh, you know uh, look at the DNA or look at portions of the DNA or look at the RNA uh, or you know different uh, aspects of it from from different perspective and ask more than one question actually ask several questions which which is really what you know we have seen the past uh, you know uh, five or six years that there's been an explosion of data uh, you know in, in terms of uh, genetics and cancer and so uh, some of the common approaches that uh, you know many investigators including some of the large uh, consortiums such as tcg have taken into approach is to start looking at the alterations that are happening at the dna level and and one of the approaches here is uh, whole exome sequencing which essentially uh, what you're looking at is all the exons and all the uh, annotated genes in the uh, the human uh, reference assembly uh, that one wants to sequence and look at, you know, how that is different from the expected reference sequence. Uh, some other approaches, which is even wider scale, is looking at the entire genome, and essentially you're looking at all the, you know, three billion base pairs uh, to sort of get a, uh, you know, a sense of uh, what is happening even beyond the coding sequence. When you talk about exome sequencing, we are looking at approximately one percent of the entire genome. Uh, so you can imagine the rest of the 99 percent of the genome, which is uh, you know, so-called or many of times referred to as the dark matter or things that have been uncharted. Uh, I think I think that those are the you know the 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 areas to look at for cancer. Uh, but again, uh, there are different approaches that you know are, are taken in terms of research. Uh, if we scale down in terms of what we want to look at, uh, you know, people have look, looked at a subset of alterations in the DNA sequence, and that including, you know, targeted sequence, which are not necessarily the entire exome. Uh, there has been uh, the other very popular approach is actually looking at the transcriptomes, you know, the whole transcriptome, one of those uh, techniques that, you know, really sort of um, uh, help look at the alterations in a in a very different perspective, and it's not only is not only informative about what the DNA alterations are, but also some of the impact 
of DNA alterations that occur, uh, you know, that that affect uh, splicing, that affect you know translation, uh, transcription in general. Uh, so, uh, so with that, uh, you know, uh, the, the thing to look at is, you know, when we talk about sequencing, uh, how has sequencing evolved over and why is, within the past, you know, few years, we've seen this explosion of sequencing, uh, tech, you know, the sequencing data coming out of cancer. Uh, and, and it all began with, you know, conventional Sanger sequencing. And here I don't have the gel images, which, you know, many of you, at least I haven't seen, but many of you in your, you know, uh, career have seen, is where, uh, you know, the, the, the concept was using, uh, a dye terminator based uh, sequencing approach where you know all different uh, fragments of uh, dna sequence depending on where you would end one of these uh, you know dd ntps getting incorporated and then looking through a sequence of uh, how those uh, uh, you know uh, short sequences come out through you know either capillary retrophoresis or previously using uh, some sort of um, you know radioactive dyes uh, to infer what the you know what the sequence is uh, but you know the limitation there was although you know it has been incredible because uh, this convention sanger sequencing was our first revolution of the entire human genome and so if you if you recollect from the you know the the uh, uh, the outcomes of the human genome project which took 13 years to to assemble the entire human genome uh, that was done using a bunch of uh, sanger sequencing machines and so what that has led to uh, and 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 we sort of you know have the privilege of using that resource uh, which is publicly available and has been versioned and curated over a long period of time is is the ability to use that reference sequence and use uh, what is referred to as the high throughput sequencing uh, technologies uh, to uh, to massively parallel that process out and uh, shrink the amount of time required to then you know look at the uh, the exome of the genome of uh, of, uh, of human beings <coughs> and several organisms as well and really the power of high throughput sequencing comes from the fact that it not only it is massively parallel but also the aspect of uh, uh, dynamic data capture and preservation uh, is also massively parallel and so that renders not only the fact that you can look at a sequence and have a qualitative assessment of what you know the sequence alterations are but there is also an aspect of quantitation in terms of uh, you know the number of reads that are redundantly uh, confirming or refuting uh, evidence at a site or a loci in the genome. So, uh, what are the you know major uh, sort of you know uh, common and commercially available sequencing platforms that you know are fairly popular and been used either in the clinic or in the research uh, domain are essentially based upon you know two major uh, approaches. Either you're looking at optic based uh, you know. Uh, uh, sequence capture technique, which is you know typically one which uh, you know the Illumina sequencers employ, where uh, it's a standard sequence by synthesis process where single base incorporation is measured using uh, you know uh, certain fluorophores, uh, which then are tiled over as a time capture of images, and as the computer then processes the data for each of the uh, spatial data points over a period of uh, the time in terms of uh, the cycle of the sequencing. And then they're able to infer those short read sequences. On the other hand, uh, semiconductor-based sequencing is uh, in another very popular uh, sequencing technique where uh, they employ the fact that uh, incorporation or base uh, nucleotide incorporation uh, step actually uh, releases two moieties. There is a pyrophosphate, there are two phosphate moieties that are released, and there is a hydrogen ion that is released as part of that, uh, you know, uh, esterification reaction. And so, uh, what the semiconductor-based sequencing employ is they use these sort of small micro wells or uh, micro pH meter like things where uh, within the well. Uh, it monitors for the change in the uh, uh, hydrogen ion concentration, which is essentially what most pH meters do. And based on the amount of uh, uh, hydrogen ion released there and the change in the uh, quanta of the hydrogen ions, uh, the semiconductor base at the bottom is then able to convert that into electrical impulse. And as that has been done over a period of time, uh, the sequence from each of the well is then inferred as uh, you know, short read sequences. So then we come to the aspect of uh, whole exome sequencing, bioinformatics pipeline design considerations. Given the fact that we now have this sort of you know, brief understanding about you know, the scope of measurements, you know, how the data is actually measured in terms of either a semiconductor or a uh, optical based approach, uh, uh, what, what should be the design considerations when uh, talking about building a pipeline? And here I give the example of whole exome sequencing because that's sort of what I've done uh, as kind of the first step. 
but uh, th this is something which is universal for uh, you know any kind of uh, data analysis pipeline design that one would uh, you know envision uh, to process sequencing data and so the first thing to start with is well what is my starting material and you know with with uh, you know with research or with you know even with clinical uh, uh, practice uh, one of the most common type of uh, sample that is available for uh, you know for for routine testing or assay uh, particularly for cancer is uh, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissue and this is you know this is something what is universally done in surgical pathology and that's why that you know that that uh, remains to be the most common the relatively you know cost effective uh, you know uh, material to begin with uh, although with the limitations that you know uh, some of which really you know, affect the quality of the dna on the other hand fresh or frozen tissue is another uh, you know uh, you know a very uh, good quality sample that you know yields good quality dna or rna uh, is also options but it, it you know it definitely requires some sort of orchestrated coordination between you know the ors the pathologists uh, to have a you know have a facility that holds on to all those you know uh, frozen tissue and so uh, in general uh, it tends to be the less common uh, commonly used starting material the other consideration that i you know that i was going to going through as i was developing the pipeline is uh, you know dna or rna sequencing or both and 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 you know starting with the fact that i did not have one or the other preference and as i was looking at to see you know what are the most common studies that people are doing uh, something that could be done very easily on uh, you know paraffin embedded tissue uh, the first thing you know the, the the thing the obvious answer to me was uh, you know dna as a starting material to look at and so uh, that's kind of how i you know uh, chose to at least start off you know with that being the first direction then the next thing is the scope of measurement and this is you know debating between targeted sequencing you know mini exomes medical exome looking at the entire exome or looking at the whole genome and and again there are uh, you know there are uh, questions to ask before you start to you know develop a pipeline that would you know that would be tackling that data and couple of the things that i look back into the literature looking as to see you know what is the most commonly used modality uh, for at least you know in terms of an investigation purpose to look at cancer and if you can see here from uh, the the figure on the top left uh, you know uh, it essentially shows uh, from i believe from 2012 to 2013 um, uh, you know a study that looked at the you know the frequency of different investigation studies that were done and what kind of modality was used and here as you can see the whole exome sequencing kind of you know uh, peaks up uh, you know in, in terms of the usage uh, similarly you know many of you are aware of uh, you know this uh, massive effort by tcga to sequence you know a large uh, variety of you know different tumor types and you know of the different modalities that they've used uh, whole exome sequencing kind of remains sort of the most commonly used modality you know for which uh, you know the large the largest number of you know cancer sample data is available uh, at least publicly for you know for use so that's why uh, you know at least the, you know, the one of the things i decided was okay, it seems like this is the most commonly used technology so i think that should be something to be the first thing to be you know foc uh, focusing on and really the other thing that comes is essentially you know uh, the computational requirement uh, how much compute pro you know uh, power do you need to you know to handle the kind of data that you're generating and this is not only compute power that has to do with just pure data analysis but also the sequencing instrument capacity that is able to give that amount of high throughput so uh, you know you are able to get a reasonable amount of coverage for the you know targeted region of interest and so here again uh, based on you know uh, you know the lab i collaborate with which i'm going to you know uh, shortly sort of get into the details of uh, you know it and and you know the resource that was available for me uh, to be to to you know to handle the sequence data uh, it it seemed like whole exome sequencing was probably the best you know starting point and so from that the next set of questions to ask was what kind of sequencing platform and what kind of capture kit would i use you know in, to, in to 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 do the whole exome sequencing and so here uh, this is where you know uh, I, I you know i started the collaboration with dr uh, william uh, lafamros he, he's uh, he directs the genomic facility for the uh, cancer biomarker uh, uh, part of, uh, of of the sequencing process and then uh, and, and has been you know a really good collaborator for the past uh, couple of years in terms of uh, being able to do the sequencing you know in his lab 
and so uh, whole exome sequencing essentially you know was something that you know he also was uh, you know gaining more experience with as I mean, he was, as he was collaborating with you know many of his um, uh, uh, teams one of the things that you know we uh, looked at was a different uh, capture uh, you know kits that were available uh, you know we looked at uh, you know we actually generated whole exome sequencing data from uh, you know from agile and sure select uh, version 6 uh, which covers about 60 mb uh, of uh, words of sequence and you know, has more than 20,000 annotated genes covered within its you know, region of interest. We also compared to the Illumina TrueSight uh, exome kit that has a little less coverage than that, but uh, also sort of you know, uh, try that out to see how the uh, profiles were in terms of you know, the regions that were covered, the depth of coverage, how uniform was that, and, and if there are areas where it really yielded you know, higher coverage than not. And so based on that initial sort of you know, uh, walkthrough of the, of, of the data, it, it sounded like, you know, it, it was agile and uh, agile and your select was kind of the you know, way to go. So that's what we uh, proceeded with. Um, uh, in his lab, um, initially he had a solid sequencer, and I think you know, more recently he got a Illumina NextSeq 500, which is you know uh, has the reasonable amount of uh, uh, throughput to be able to uh, do you know a good number of uh, whole exome sequences. Um, uh, you know we kind of targeted about uh, 70 to uh, 80x of coverage for you know each uh, sample that we would sequence. And 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 so we decided to uh, you know go up with the parent sequencing, which is kind of ideally the way you should be doing for whole exome sequencing. With you know starting with the 75 base pair times two you know uh, parent sequencing uh, module, uh, with about 260 million reads of throughput, uh, it it was you know it was a, a fairly good balance between cost per uh, sample you know for research versus uh, you know the amount of throughput in terms of co average coverage per uh, uh, exome that I want to get. Uh, in terms of starting material, uh, you know, paraffin uh, FFP tissue essentially was you know, what I had in plenty for the bladder cancer samples that I was interested in, uh, and you know, and I also had some reference material that I wanted to kind of run through and uh, to uh, to make sure that you know the, the the sequencing quality, you know, the data analysis was robust. And so uh, I started off with FFP tissue and uh, extracted DNA from some of these you know, commercially available vendors. Um, uh, the minimal DNA requirement for this setup was about 200 nanograms, which uh, in our experience, about 10 unstained slides, if they're cut at 10 microns uh, uh, per block, that's sufficient to get to that point, unless you have a very small tissue within that block, or for some reason, uh, the you know proportion of uh, viable tumor cells are very low. Uh, but usually that you know works out fairly well. Um, in terms of uh, tumor normal pair versus tumor only uh, strategy, initially I began with uh, a fact that I would be able to, you know, I would restrict myself to doing tumor and normal paired, which is still something that I prefer. Uh, but uh, as I developed the pipeline, I was able to accommodate for scenarios where a paired normal tissue was not available. Uh, in terms of minimum proportion of viable tumor cells in the specimen, uh, there is, you know, there is published data about, you know, uh, things people talk about from 30%, 50%. Some people have gone down to as low as 20%. Uh, uh, for the fact that I was also interested in, uh, you know, getting copy number analysis uh, for the, you know, for the samples that I've uh, worked on so far, I've tried to keep it to about, you know, at least uh, 50 to 60 percent of uh, proportion of viable tumor cells. Uh, so, in, you know, just a sort of a quick cap in terms of the hybrid capture process. I mean, this is a standard, you know, sure select uh, target enrichment process. I'm using the version six of it, and essentially these are. Uh, you know, after the genomic DNA is sort of you know uh, uh, fragmented, uh, which I think is using Covaris and uh, you know uh, uh, Dr. Lafamba's lab, uh, it then is uh, you know incubated with the uh, the RNA baits that are specific for those you know regions of the exome that we want to pick up. Uh, following that, they're then uh, uh, you know uh, mixed with these uh, streptovidin coated uh, magnetic beads. Uh, which following hybridization then are able to be easily extracted out and then washed up with the buffer and then yielding the you know DNA sequence of interest uh, you know that that we get and uh, it, as we have done with FFP samples so far it seems to be a fairly reasonable uh, you know uh, uh, fragment size distribution of you know these uh, DNA molecules as we go through this process and I'll show you some of the uh, data how that looks like. Uh, this is just again another standard library prep uh, process, uh, you know, following that, uh, following the hybrid capture. And essentially, uh, you know, what is done is after the fact that you know the the DNA sequence of interest are uh, captured in, it then goes through a cycle of uh, 
uh, PCR amplifications to include the indexing primers, uh, and then they are pulled in together if you're using barcode, which you typically use uh, to, to multiplex, you know, more than one sample, and then, uh, you know, to uh, get the enriched uh, library. Uh, how a library construct looks like once the library process is done in this, uh, you know, in, in, in this setup is um, the, the middle portion of, you know, that book sequence is the insert DNA sequence of interest. They're then flanked by the sequencing binding primers, uh, followed by the barcode indices that, uh, you know, uh, uh, that would be identifying the uh, sample um, uh, ID for that particular uh, bar, uh, for that particular sequence fragment, and then followed by the oligobinding sites, which essentially help uh, adhere these uh, sequences to the flow cell. Uh, the parent sequencing and data capture essentially is a fairly standard Illumina process where you know many of you are aware of, uh, where it goes through a process of uh, bridge amplification to uh, you know create the polony clusters, and then followed by uh, a standard um, uh, non-determinator. Uh, uh, sequence by synthesis reaction where individual bases as they get incorporated uh, you know, on the flow cell clusters are then uh, you know, recorded and then you know, the, the sequence is inferred from that optical data. So uh, in terms of design considerations, after you know, uh, making up my mind in terms of sequencing platform and the capture kit available, uh, the next thing was the computation. So once you have the data, uh, what do I need to understand in terms of you know, the, the data itself? Uh, how do I, you know, manage the infrastructure at least locally? What I have to begin with, uh, you know, what kind of sequence uh, data quality control I need to keep in mind to make sure that the, you know, the data that I'm analyzing is indeed robust or identify, you know, areas of improvement, and then uh, the aspects of data management and collaboration. So this is sort of a very high-level, simplified uh, overview of, you know, what uh, data analysis for any kind of NGS data looks like. And essentially, it starts off with the fact where you know uh, the DNA sequence, uh, uh, when follow the DNA sequence reaction that you have, uh, you know, uh, raw data acquisition. It goes through a process of signal processing and then base calling, which is where the you know the the the, the popular FASTQ files or the unaligned BAM files are generated. Uh, the, it then follows a step, or sometimes precedes that in terms of demultiplexing. If you have multiplex or multiple multiple samples in the same run. Um, and once uh, the, that demultiplex FASTQ file is available uh, with all the quality scores, necessary quality scores, it then goes through the process of sequence alignment, which then generates the uh, the BAM file. This is also one of the common you know, file names that uh, you know, many of you would be aware of. And then following that, uh, there is a whole uh, you know process of identifying different alterations. And this is depending on you know the 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 disease of interest, the you know the the type of cancer people are looking at, or something specifically that they want to you know, inquire. Uh, but you know it ranges from uh, single nuclear variants variance to uh, uh, you know insertion deletions, either small or very large, uh, or looking at large structural variations, including uh, you know gene fusion events, uh, or looking at copy number changes. And these are typically you know amplification or deletions in the you know genes of interest. And finally, depending on whichever technique is applied, then you know, each of these identified variants are then uh, 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 represented in a, uh, as a list of variants, typically in a VCF file or some modification of that uh, to accommodate some of the unusual, you know, the variants that are detected. Uh, on the right, um, if you see the scale in terms of data sizes, uh, we are looking at terabytes of data. If you have you know, raw sequencing data to the point as you, you know, keep processing that, it comes down to uh, gigabytes and you know, megabytes of data. The reason I have it purposefully here is because this is what the common notion is. As we go from the more raw data to the to the you know the, to the towards get a beginning list of variants, that uh, the data size reduces. As a matter of fact, the things to be considered is once you get to the point that you have you know the VCF file to begin with, there is a lot of post processing that goes in to annotate those files to associate different databases. Uh, for cross references, which actually at the end of the day increases, uh, you know, the, the net file size that you, you know, need to maintain and you know move around. So that's something to keep in mind as you're designing your pipeline. So uh, the question that you know was the biggest question that came to me at the time, and this is you know about one and a half years back when I was trying to implement the pipeline, is you know what kind of resources do I use? Do I go for a local server or do I go for you know some sort of a high performance compute cluster or use using some of the cloud services? Um, at that time, uh, you know, based on the IRB that I had, it you know 
kind of did not explicitly state using uh, cloud services. And the second is at that time, UPMC was, you know, a little more apprehensive in terms of the, you know, uh, the, the response I got back saying, no, not at this time, you should, you know, keep the data locally and then figure out, we'll talk about this later on. And so uh, what I ended up doing was uh, provisioning a local uh, server, which you know, again I appreciate the help of the you know of, of, of the department to help us uh, you know help me get that. And essentially, I configured it in a way so that I had the optimal resources to be able to process a uh, a whole exome sequencing. This is certainly not uh, enough to either think of multiple parallel scaling for doing whole exome sequencing or whole genome for that matter. Uh, but uh, you know, uh, essentially, what I did was. I end up with having uh, you know, two parallel Intel core processors with about 20 cores each. Each core had about, uh, you know, they, each core has two threads, data threads that you can actually push the data through uh, using, you know, maximum utilization of the associated memory blocks. And so that really ended up uh, giving me about 40, you know, 40 cores worth of, uh, you know, uh, uh, power that I can run through you know, if I want to parallelize to that. Uh, uh, the, the RAM installed on that was around 288 gigs, and this is appropriate to about the level of parallelization that I've developed with the whole exome sequencing. In terms of storage, this was the biggest problem that I encountered, and uh, this uh, was um, not only the fact that I just had to store the file, but also to the fact that how can I optimize my data analysis so it is, uh, you know, it, it's fast enough. And, and, and this, um, you know, it, it, this essentially uh, included the fact that uh, you don't want to end up having a sequence analysis, a whole exome sequencing that takes, you know, uh, a day or more than that for an entire, you know, and you know, a set of uh, paired tumor normal. So, uh, you know, storage is at least one of the things that you can optimize on these things. And so, what I did was I tiered out the storage that was installed on these servers to uh, to get to the point that I have a reasonable amount of hot storage where essentially the actual compute and the I/O stuff is working on and followed by a larger warm storage where I keep moving in back and forth the files which are not being actively used for compute or are used for compute in a way that uh, the IO is minimum. And then uh, the third aspect is, which is the cold storage, where once all the analysis is done, you just essentially dump the data uh, to be you know, either shared or then you know, retrieved on later time. So how does the workflow look like at this point of time? So uh, it starts off for most of the, uh, uh, the analysis that I have done or you know, uh, investigators that I've collaborated with. Uh, the data usually starts off from uh, an FFP tissue, uh, typically followed by an area of uh, you know, tumor that is microdissected, uh, followed by DNA extraction. For some of the reference material that I've used from the commercially available you know, sources, uh, they start off with the extracted DNA, so they'll provide you with DNA under different conditions, and and so you know, so I started with that as well. Uh, this typically follows the fragmentation, capture, and library prep that I've just shown you before, followed by sequencing on you know the Nexic uh, 500. Um, uh, once the data is available, uh, it then gets uh, forked into these you know different uh, aspects of detection. So uh, the ones in the gray box are the one which I'm actively working on, and you know they are not implemented yet. The ones in green are where uh, I have it, uh, you know, working as sort of a phase one, phase two, uh, you know, uh, set up in terms of, you know, the variant colors and all these specifications. So uh, the things that I'm being actively doing with many of the sequencing cohort is looking at point mutations or single nucleotide variants, uh, small indels, which typically we're referring to about, uh, you know, arbitrarily to about one to 10 base pairs, and then medium to large size indels where we're talking about you know anything from uh, you know 11, about 11 to um, as large as you know 60, 80, or 100 base pairs you know length. Obviously, the limitation here would be your uh, you know read length that you get from you know the parent sequencing. So in my case, obviously, I've limited it to you know I'm, I I don't expect to pick up things which are you know greater than 70 to 80 base pairs in a you know in a reliable way, um, with some exceptions. Uh, and then the downstream process goes from there is uh, the you know the aspect of variant annotation which is obviously as you all know uh, critically important to to really annotate and identify what the variants you have and then followed by the aspect of variant prioritization which is sort of like the shade of green and gray is because it's again an active area that i'm working on to uh, bring in a lot of uh, automation and you know uh, uh, and, and algorithmic logic uh, but right now it is done in a semi manual way in terms of curating and looking at the variants and then the aspect of data visualization where you're able to put together all that data and show it in sort of a uh, in, in a summarized way that uh, that helps you identify or discover 
or have insights into the data at sort of like the first or second stage of looking at uh, you know, the exome sequencing um, data. So the pipeline. So let, now this is essentially what the meat of uh, the discussion is. Uh, and I'm going to go over uh, sort of blocks of the pipeline as they are to relate to the different uh, you know, uh, key aspects of how the data is processed. So when we talk about whole exome sequencing bioinformatics pipeline, they are essentially, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can split them up into different baskets or modules of how the data is handled. Uh, to begin with, first is the pre-alignment sequence analysis. And this typically begins with the sequencer generating some sort of a, a sequence file, which is either human readable or more of a binary encoded one. Uh, with most Illumina sequencers, and as with NextSeq 500 as well, uh, it typically generates uh, a bunch of BCL files for each of the, uh, you know, the, the pair of the reads. And uh, there is an onboard, uh, uh, you know, uh, way where uh, the computer, the, the onboard software is able to use BCL to FASTQ conversion to generate the FASTQ, uh, you know, the FASTQ ready files, including trimming the adapters. Um, I've started using, I've started my pipeline from the FASTQ at this point of time, uh, but you know this is certainly possible to you know get back to using BCL to FASTQ off the sequencer as well. Uh, but it's just more for convenience and for data transfer uh, aspects that uh, you know we chose to use uh, FASTQ files, uh, you know, as as kind of the starting for point for the pipeline. And then uh, once those FASTQ files are generated, each of these uh, per lane FASTQ files again split by the uh, the pair reads which are then concatenated into lane-specific FASCU files. Uh, these then undergo uh, the uh, trimming of the low-quality bases. And this is, uh, this is particularly important to decrease the noise, uh, you know, in, in terms of the, um, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the sequence quality that comes up. And this is uh, particularly so when uh, the coverage of sequencing at a region is not very high. And this is typically what you would see with, uh, you know, whole exome sequencing. Uh, so I made sure that uh, at least the low quality bases at the very end of the reads, you know, if there are any, would either be trimmed away or if there are too many, then essentially discard the read from there. And once these trimmed FASTQ files again for each of the pairs are ready, then it undergoes a QC using FASTQC to kind of profile how the read looks like and how the quality distribution metrics are. Uh, the second step is the sequence alignment. So once the sequences are ready, uh, the alignment process then goes over the fact that uh, you know you have to use some sort of a uh, an alignment algorithm to do uh, to essentially match out the sequence that you got from the sample to the you know the human reference genome. And so in this case, uh, I chose to use BWA. There are you know several other aligners available out there in terms of uh, you know use for whole exome sequencing. I did try using you know Novo line as one of the options, uh, although you know it's it's paid. It does perform uh, in some aspects you know a little better than uh, BWA. Um, you know, but you know using four or five different uh, aligners, uh, BWA turned out to be sort of the best in terms of how uh, you know the kind of data I was getting. And so, uh, once the alignment is done, uh, you know, it essentially generates a raw SAM file, which typically, in my case, the way I have set it up is as an intermediate file. Uh, I then have samples encoded into a binary alignment file, which is typically the common file you want to use for, uh, you know, further processing. Once the sequence alignment is achieved, and here on the on on just to mention that for the projects that I've been doing so far, I've uh, I've restricted myself to the human genome. Uh, version 19 or GRC is 37. This is the predecessor of the current version of the genome. It's still one of the most widely available, uh, you know, sequences fairly well characterized, although there are some certain limitations to GRC is 37 in terms of the, you know, the, the alignment, um, the, the, the assembly annotation. Uh, there are also, uh, one of the things is most of the databases that are available, including some of the uh, you know, uh, uncommon or rare databases still use GRCS37, and so that's the reason uh, that I've been, you know, uh, sticking to that. Uh, the next step from that is the post alignment processing, and this is where once you have the aligned reads, you want to you know clean them up, uh, you know, typically sorting them, indexing them, in a, you know, based on your uh, chromosomal order, uh, and then marking the duplicates, which is you know critical for. Uh, for a you know hybrid culture based process to make sure that you know you don't have redundant uh, reads that are uh, duplicates and they skew the call in terms of it being a variant or an uh, uh, homozygous reference. Uh, once uh, that process is done, it then goes through uh, the next step set of steps, which is the pre-variant uh, calling processing, and this is where 
uh, one of the important steps uh, that uh, that I found was fairly helpful uh, was to be able to do local realignments to improve the indel detection. And this is uh, this is different from the alignment that I mentioned before, which is more of a global alignment approach where you essentially take your short read sequence, align it across the entire genome, and get the best match to see where you know they fall in. Uh, this here um, uh, helps. So so. Uh, the, the the local realignment really is geared towards improving the uh, specifically the indel detection and how does it do that in the uh, in in the aspect of local realignment is uh, i have to specify uh, the, you know the gatk indel realigner to use a certain set of uh, you know uh, of of white listed indels that i want to essentially look for specifically and rescue and here i provide that using these different vcf files from uh, cosmic uh, DB Snape and the Mills Indel, uh, which then essentially specifically realigns those regions uh, to, to improve the sequence quality there and for the variant caller to be able to pick up. Uh, many variant callers, including the one that GATK provides, uh, actually has uh, Indel realignment built in. So this is an option step for that. Uh, however, the aligner that I used, at least uh, the variant caller that I used, at least one of them, which is VARSCAN, uh, does not have that built in. And so uh, this particular step uh, uh, and, you know, added to improving the quality. The next step from that is using is is uh, is once you have the realigned uh, band files, we need to then do another step of QC to see uh, not only sequence quality but also the aspects of alignment and, and how well it uh, you know it, it, it mapped out or there are there are areas of concern that I need to uh, be aware of. Uh, and the next step is then to identify the variations, and we are talking of uh, you know here looking at uh, you know uh, changes in the DNA sequence. And, and these are the different examples of the types of variants that one would be expecting to you know, see in the sample. Either you're looking at a single nuclear variant, which is essentially a single uh, change at a given locus, versus uh, looking at uh, you know, alterations like deletion, where you have missing sequences in your sample, or uh, insertions where you have extra sequence in your sample, which creates a gap in the, you know, in the reference uh, as it is aligned, or uh, complex variants, which are rare, but are fairly challenging to, to detect. Uh, as you can see here, this is a SNV, this is a small deletion, and this is an insertion. They're right next to each other, interspersed by uh, you know uh, unaltered bases, and 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 these are essentially primitives as they're commonly referred to, or you know individual calls. But really, what they represent is uh, a, a haplotype of you know the alteration being a replacement of uh, the sequence that is in the reference with the one that we are seeing here in the uh, in the sample. Uh, again, harder to detect. Many variant callers don't uh, do a good job at calling the entire complex variant. They would call in the individual primitives. Others do. And so uh, it's something important to keep in mind. So the next step from there is to kind of look at uh, the, you know, the, the, the variant calling process. So here what I do is once the realigned BAM files, one for the tumor and one for the normal available, it then goes through the variant calling process where I've employed two variant callers. One of the variant callers I've used here is uh, VARSCAN2 in combination with uh, samples, which essentially is a fairly robust general purpose variant caller. It does a good job at calling SNVs, uh, many of the indels uh, uh, that are detected in about the small or the medium range. Uh, and it, it it has the ability then to further process that uh, in, in in a somatic mode. So here it is not merely calling variants in you know in uh, from the uh, tumor BAM and from the normal BAM and essentially just merely subtracting that. It actually when it is doing the variant calling, it moves through per locus of both the tumor and the normal BAMs, and it does uh, uh, it essentially uses a heuristic approach to uh, you know, really make a confident call in terms of it is truly somatic or not, and then associates a p-value with that. And, and so that's really helpful when, look, you know, when uh, reviewing those variant calls or you know, having a certain level of confidence as to you know, what, what has been called or not. Uh, on the other hand, uh, for uh, tackling with medium to large size indels, uh, I've employed uh, scalpel. This is, a, uh, this is essentially based on the concept of microassembly. So what it does is, uh, certain regions that are specified as to where I want to look for the indels, uh, you can uh, you can essentially make it take the sequence and do a, a de novo microassembly rather than you know realign to the reference. And so that's a alternative way of trying to pick up indels. Uh, it's again been uh, in my experience has been fairly useful to pick up some of these challenging or difficult uh, you know indels to pick up. And then once all these variants are, uh, are, are identified and represented in the VCF file and then merge them together carefully to make sure that the overlapping variants are not uh, you know, uh, overwritten or, uh, or lost. 
once they merge, uh, VSA files are available, uh, I then go through this uh, process of post uh, variant calling processing. And, and, and these include certain very important steps in terms of uh, ensuring that the, the VCF structure is valid. Uh, you know, multi-lilic records in terms of VCF files are you know, taken into account and the process of variant normalization mm. uh, then goes through. And so what really that means is uh, using an example here, uh, on the top, if you see, this is a typical representation in a VCF file in terms of you know, how a variant is represented. On the very top left, you will see uh, this is the chromosome contact in which this variant has been detected. This is the, the genomic position uh, where this, uh, you know, uh, where this expected variant is seen. Uh, this is the reference allele T here. This is the alternate allele C, and then you have a bunch of different uh, additional um, uh, metadata to support, you know, the the different aspects of the variant call. This is a typical uh, a typical representation of a variant. Uh, on the other hand, if you look at uh, a multi-allelic record, and what that what happens is, and this is truly what the variant call is trying to do, is to represent all the possible alterations it's seeing at a locus. And, and this is good and bad in a way where uh, you know, one needs to be aware that there are certain VCF records that are actually you know, encoded like this. And really what the, you know, what the encoding process here is the <coughs> reference uh, allele remains the same. However, the, the different alternative alleles that have been identified are represented here as, in this case, one two and three different representation of what is alternate as deletions or insertion separated by commas. So most alignment or most uh, VCF processing softwares are really not aware of it, unless you specifically write the scripts, which I did in my case. Uh, but uh, this is something that one needs to make sure that these are broken down into primitives before uh, or broken down to individual VCF records before you go to start to look at the annotations. Because something like this, if you ever end up trying to annotate and look at it, it will end up being one of the ones which are flagged as unknown or poor quality or not having a gene name. And typically we try to ignore them and say like, okay, in the second round I'll go and look at it. So you wanna make sure that something valuable like this, potentially valuable like this is not lost. And in this case, these are represented as deletions or duplications in the same locus, which can actually occur you know, in, in, uh, as, as true variants. Uh, the process of variant normalization here, again, is a very critical concept. And this is to the fact that when we talk about a normalized variant uh, in the genomic context, it has to be uh, uh, left aligned, as you see in the bottom example, and parsimonious. When we refer to parsimony, what that means bioinformatically is you're looking at the least possible nucleotides you can use to represent that variant. And this is something that many annotation softwares actually uh, you know, uh, uh, use in a way where it improves the quality of annotations that you get from that. So uh, there are ways, you know, there are softwares that are available to do that, but it's something important that uh, should be part of the pipeline as you design that. So this is how the rest of the pipeline looks like. Once the merge VCF file is available, I have a custom script and I use VT as one of the softwares to then uh, do the normalization process. Followed by that, I use Anobar to annotate these uh, VCF files. Uh, subsequent to that, there's a custom script that actually goes over and cleans up some of the um, uh, the ANOVAR annotations and then uses HGVS to formally put in the c.p. Uh, annotations against the transcript. And then it is uh, then essentially a optimized multi-sample VCA file is generated, which is then uh, uh, put forward for prioritization and visualization. Uh, these are the different annotation databases I've been using so far. Uh, you know, it's it's again, as I said, this is a bulk of uh, the data that, you know, that sits on, you know, either your server or your disk. And it's something to keep in mind that as you talk about VCF files, which are merely small, uh, the different annotation uh, databases that you will use uh, end up, you know, requiring a lot of resource to make sense of that VCF file. And so with all of these, you know, uh, 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 databases that I've listed here, uh, you know, on, in a realistic example, you know, it's using about, uh, 80 to 90 gigs of disk space, which is not huge, but then you know sometimes it can be you know computationally a problem. Um, some are, you know so one of the things uh, with this population frequency database, which I think you know people who know uh, we we love this because it really helps prioritizing many of your variants down to a manageable list. And so in this case, uh, you know one of the popular ones is the exact uh, consortium data. This is essentially a conglomerate of 60,000 individuals who were either whole genome or whole exome. Uh, and, uh, and, and you can see here, this is the list of, uh, you know, of all possible alterations that were identified in those uh, that, that you know, come up with a uh, computer frequency. 
The next step to that in uh, Dr. MacArthur's lab, who did the first uh, analysis in exact, they've gone to scale this up to uh, about uh, 123,000 individuals uh, who have been whole exomed or genomed. And, and this is the conglomerate of the data that's available here. So that's the next step I'm trying to incorporate it to, to get you know, a further uh, sense of how, you know, how helpful is that for you know, prioritizing many of the variants we see uh, as whole exome during whole exome sequencing. So in terms of sequencing, uh, you know, quality control, this is very important before you start to make assumption on, oh, this looks like a real variant, this is not, this is a great locus that I want to you know, pursue forward. Uh, some of the important things to look at is first the quality of sequencing data. And the way this is uh, you know, represented here, this is using the FASTQC application, is this is telling you how good the uh, quality of the nucleotides that were called in your sequencing are. And, and, and sort of you know, going uh, just you know, very briefly over this, on the y-axis is your quality scores, and on the x-axis is the length of the sequence as you start interrogating into it. So typically what you want to expect is within this green zone is where your good quality scores are, then most of your, uh, you know, most of your bases are uh, you know, uh, within that. It is expected that as you go longer into the sequence that your quality score for an individual basis drop down, but that is okay. Till the time, you know, uh, most of your sequencing quality is within this uh, kind of green zone. Typically, Illumina recommends at least uh, uh, Q30 as the score for cutoff, and that's kind of what I've been using uh, in my experiments. Uh, this is looking at the GC content distribution. Uh, the, 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 the blue line here is sort of the ideal GC content that you would expect. Uh, this is what I've been uh, seeing with you know, virtually all my exomes that have been done using uh, uh, from the FFP is it's very close and then it has this little hump here. Uh, part of the reason is that I'm still looking only at the exomes and not at the entire genome. And the second thing is there are certain artifacts of FFP which, you know, certainly gets introduced as, as biases in, you know, in particular region. But this is fairly acceptable in terms of uh, what I've seen with some of the reference materials that I've uh, uh, all exomed. Uh, the other aspects of looking at that is, you know, adapter quantity, which, you know, typically once you've processed the FASTQ file after trimming, you want to make sure that there are no contaminating adapters. Uh, the next thing is to look at uh, what is the uh, coverage metric. This is something, you know, important that all of us want to look into the sequencing data, uh, how good this is. So this is one of the examples from a, a, a reference material I looked at, and this is, you know, kind of uh, giving this sort of a, um, you know, a, a Gaussian-shaped curve and uh, you know, most of these peaks in terms of where the uh, majority of the sequences land in terms of coverage are between uh, 60 to uh, 80x, which is reasonably good and expected for you know, the way uh, and I was ex expecting from the experiment. And then we look at sequence quality in terms of duplication rate. This is fairly good, uh, where vast majority of the duplicate sequences are either one or two nucleotides in length, which is essentially what the background noise is. Uh, and then uh, here, uh, when we look at uh, the representation of the different bases, ATGCs in our sequence, uh, this is fairly good representation in terms of you know what uh, uh, you know what the amount of or the quantity of uh, your ATGCs are distributed across the you know length of the sequence. Uh, some of the other aspects to look at is the mapping quality score. So here you can see a mapping quality score of uh, somewhere between 57 and 60. This is fairly high quality score, and as you can see here. A majority of the sequences here you know, have a very high quality in terms of mapping. Uh, there are obviously certain unmapped regions that you would get, uh, which you know, is not necessarily a bad thing to happen. Um, and this is the insert size. So this is something I was talking about before, where you know, we are, when you try to challenge to see how long indels you can pick up, one of the things to look at is what is the distribution of the indels insert size that you get for your DNA sequence. And typically, with about a 75 base pair, uh, you know, uh, times two sort of a you know parent sequencing mode, uh, I've gotten to about 125 to 150 base pair worth of you know length of sequence, which kind of predominate the uh, the, the bulk of the sequences. So there is still a tail that goes down that have, you know, larger sequence insert reads, which, you know, does help in certain cases to pick up, uh, you know, to pick up larger indels. Um, uh, cohort. So what, what has gone through this pipeline so far? Uh, you know, so far I've uh, sequenced uh, the, the reference sample in a 12878. This is one of the standard reference samples that pretty much every, you know, uh, I think everybody uses. Uh, this is uh, you know, well characterized by the GIAB group, uh, the genome in a bottle group from NIST. Uh, I've also sequenced three Ashkenazi trio uh, samples, the son, dad, and mom, which are again germline you know, reference material provided by GIAB. I've uh, used two reference uh, material controls, again, well characterized 
provided by uh, this company Horizon DX. Uh, these are kind of the two, you know, um, the code names for that. And uh, it is actually good because uh, they provide the uh, extracted DNA which uh, have undergone the FFP, you know, treatment process. And so you can simulate uh, how your, uh, you know, how how that would look like, uh, you know, as compared to your actual FFP samples. And then uh, through that, it's you know, I've had sequenced about ten urethral carcinomas pairs. So far, eleven bladder adenocarcinomas. About uh, you know uh, approximately 30 pancreatic neuron tumors in collaboration with Dr. Atul Singhi, uh, 13 mesotheliomas again in collaboration with Dr. Atul Singhi, and then additional urothelial and pancreatic samples are sort of scheduled for sequencing. So uh, about you know 50 or 60 of the exomes, mostly most of them being impaired, uh, you know in terms of analysis. A very prelim data in terms of you know how the prioritization looks like. So when I start off with looking at the total waiting calls. Uh, for tumor, there are about 60,000 calls from a typical exome run uh, of uh, 70 to 80 is coverage. Uh, when when I prioritize to look at only the somatic calls that the variant caller says, that comes down to about three and a half thousand. And then after the different prioritization processes that I have, including you know the different annotation steps, it boils down to about 300 variants. And this is an example for bladder tumors. Obviously, that number would vary depending on your sequencing a bladder tumor versus a thyroid versus a pancreatic neuroendocrine tumors depending on what their underlying biology is. In terms of variant confirmation strategies, since uh, you know, it's, it's still validating that, uh, you know, whenever possible, you know, review of the sequence pileup is kind of the best friend, followed by Sanger sequencing uh, or using IHC or FISH uh, for confirmation. I also have certain samples that I've run in the MGP laboratory as either part of a clinical uh, process or a research uh, sample through the clinical pipeline. So that's helpful in confirming those, you know, in, in those cases. And then using the high confidence uh, variant call sets that are provided by these reference material uh, providers. The typical run times that I've seen so far with uh, the primary and secondary data analysis is going from FASTQ to VCF. For a tumor normal pair, it's about four to five hours. And I'm trying to you know, uh, optimize that to get the time down. For tumor only, it takes about uh, two to three hours. Uh, one of the things that I've been developing as part of, you know, visualizing the exome data, uh, there have been like you know, a couple of these things that, uh, you know, I've uh, one of you know, one of a very smart resident here in our you know, in our program helped me actually, you know, uh, work with him and build this up. So one of them is this uh, JS Comia plot. This is a JavaScript library that we develop, and you know, we have the source code posted in GitHub. Uh, that essentially uh, uh, allows you to integrate that, uh, you know, uh, integrate that JavaScript app in any you know, web application, and then you can put in essentially your exome data uh, in terms of the variants, you know, the gene names and the type of variation that you're seeing, and it automatically plots out that map for you. Uh, what what we have done forward is to actually allow a lot of interaction here, and I'm and unfortunately I don't have uh, the interface ready up here, but it allows you not only to kind of you know, look at what the data looks like or use it for your publications, it also allows you to hover over and see what the annotations are. It uh, it it allows you to move around uh, variations, switch samples, and see how it looks like. Uh, it's it, you know it's uh, designed in a way that you can use a desktop, you can use touch screen devices on your mobile phones to kind of you know, play around with the data. The other thing that you have uh, developed uh, this is called JS Protein Mapper. This is also a JavaScript module, and I have an example of here of it here. Um, um, let's see if it opens up. Okay, I don't know if it is optimized for this, but let's see. So uh, what this does is if you have if you are looking at specific variants that are of interest and want to see how that compares with different databases. So I'm going to pull up, so this is all um, mock-up data, so there's nothing real here. Let's see why is it not typing. Uh, something froze. Anyway, anyway, I'm sorry. I'm not able to pull that up here. But anyway, what 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 that what that uh, helps doing is once you have the data integrated, uh, you know, uh, you know, once you have the exome data available and you're looking for certain variations to see, you know, how where in the protein domain of the of you know, of a particular gene it maps, how it aligns to you know the say the Cosmic database or the DBSNP database, uh, you know, you you are able to uh, you know pull that information out based on uh, you know what variations you're looking at. Um, 
the next step from that is is you know i'm i'm working on to you know optimize and add in several components to the you know the pipeline uh, one of the things is to uh, have a you know module for tumor contamination estimation based off from the sequencing data and this is something that you know it's it's it, i think it's a very uh, a reasonable thing to do in terms of you know rather than relying on a more uh, you know uh, uh, kind of an approximate estimation from the slides uh you know to be able to compute it from the from the sequencing data i'm um, also looking at developing pipelines for uh, copy number variations for calculating tube and mutation burden which is i think is a very important component now in determining um uh, you know uh, eligibility for immunotherapy and so that's i think that's a uh, that's a very neat thing to add on to uh, i'm also developing uh, additional algorithms to detect uh, complex indels one of the examples here is the uh, the internal time term duplication mutation that is seen in the flit 3 gene and uh, and which is usually missing from most uh, standard exome pipelines and then aspects of variant prioritization and you know data visualization other aspects i'm looking at is to essentially improve the entire deploy you know deployment of this pipeline and be able to use leverage some of the cloud computing services uh, you know to to kind of further scale this up uh, and then uh, the other aspect that i haven't even started looking at but you know as i'm thinking and going through my slides is is using whole you know whole slide imaging to integrate uh, you know the the uh, you know kind of the morphologic data as you know as the entire exome data is been reviewed um other things uh, you know this is something that i've been working on with one of my fellows in you know in our in our program uh, is essentially uh, trying to automate or semi automate the process of variant prioritization and annotation and this is based off on the recent guidelines that came out for interpretation of uh, uh, you know uh, interpretation reporting of sequence variants in cancer where you know certain guidelines have been laid out in terms of you know what helps prioritize a variant to be something which is clinically significant versus something which might be benign or variant of uncertain significance uh, so so that's that's in the works as well um in in addition to that uh, you know one of the major things that i'm doing is to get to the point that i can increase you know essentially do a formal validation of this to a point that you know it's close to something uh, that would be you know at least you know uh, comparable to a, a a clinical validation again there's a lot that goes in there there is you know it's it's a it's a long road ahead but uh, you know it's i'm started to taking some baby steps towards that uh, you know the way that i've been doing that is essentially trying to at least determine the sensitivity and the false positive rate of of the pipeline and specifically for the different variant types uh, the benchmark variant sources that i've been kind of you know, trying to curate are uh, the high confidence calls that i've you know just mentioned before um uh, for some of the reference samples uh, i've uh, i have a you know bunch of sequencing that i've done Uh, as part of the clinical pipeline in the MGB laboratory, which is a clinically validated pipeline, and so the idea is to see, whole exome those and see at least a subset of those variants that have been uh, called, you know, from uh, from the clinical pipeline are really picked up by the exome. And then uh, the process of sample exchange with other laboratories that I'm trying to collaborate and you know uh, send out, especially with the laboratories that are actually doing clinical whole exome sequencing. And at this point of time for cancer, which is you know handful to count, and so uh, I'm hoping you know I'll be able to collaborate. Every one of those laboratories to 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 you know get that data from a exome to exome comparison. So with that, I want to thank you know a, a whole sort of you know a bunch of individuals here uh, from the you know the genomic division of the cancer biomarker facility led by Dr. William Laframbos and and, and his team, uh, the molecular and genomic pathology lab, you know uh, Dr. Nikki Forov and Dr. Nikki Forova and the team of people there who uh, including the you know the bioinformatics team who's helped. me a lot with some of the research samples i've you know i've, I've done there uh, the the fish lab uh, you know kim kora she has been instrumental in helping me with uh, you know the hnes fish ihc stains uh, you know uh, from getting on stain uh, blocks and all that uh, the head and neck spore uh, has been really sort of you know helpful for part of the validation uh, that i'm doing with the pipeline um, i i got uh, uh, a career enhancement program grant awarded for a year which kind of helped me you know cure some of the resources to start the validation process and also you know uh, in collaboration with dr uh, robert ferris has been sort of you know uh, uh, you know i'm being able to have a chance to start analyzing some of his uh, whole exome data um, in addition a number of collaborators from department of pathology which has been a huge help for me to kind of you know uh, really smoothen out the pipeline uh, dr atul singh dr dhir dr uh, sunny desik and dr kyozi and then uh, in terms of data visualization uh, tom pierce he's the resident who really helped me kind of you know develop many of these uh, 
uh, applications and then uh, for the whole exome sequence validation uh, i have another resident dr daniel marker uh, he's currently helping me out with you know a lot of these uh, validation studies so so with that thank you for your attention and if there are any questions i can take as well thank you yes Can you comment a little bit on the allele frequency, the cutoff for the platform platform and the cutoff for the platform? Yes. And what would you define as a driver? What kind of allele frequency? Do you sure. So allele frequency is one of the things with uh, whole exome sequencing is you need to be mindful of. what your target coverage is for the regions that you are you know are interested in clinically or at least you know from a research standpoint uh with with the exome uh, sequencing lab uh, with these i've hit about 70 to 80x at regions it goes beyond 100x in terms of coverage uh so it really depends on where i'm looking at and what is the coverage that i get for that region or the bin uh i i've typically set to about 10% uh we're in really fraction below which you know the confidence really goes down and and this is also in correlation with the quality control markers that you know where where i've seen something which is low uh, frequency is really hard to either validate or match up with the quality controls that the varying color calls up with um they are real or not you know they might be real but uh, w- with the depth that i have it's hard to you know uh, establish that certain regions in the exome really go up to 400x coverage and so there i've sometimes considered anything which is about 8 or 9% we have to you know to to do that in terms of determining driver by vaf um um if you lucky enough to see a p3ca braf you know ras mutation about you know uh, 12% 15% you know 30% allelic frequency um yes then you have sort of a ballpark as to where your vaf cluster would be for the drivers and then you can sort of stack it out you know clonal subclonal potentially clonal subclonal population although with this low depth it is hard to do that uh tumor suppressors more so although they are not really drivers but sometimes they seem to be like one of the early events uh, i have seen typically them between uh anywhere between 10% to 30% uh depending on again you know the depth and usually you know uh, uh, the one collaborator i worked with uh, they used ihc to sort of look for loss of that particular protein expression and in 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 you know in majority of those calls it turned out to be fine the ones that didn't validate were the ones that were below 10% so so i've sort of now uh, you know uh, I, i don't go below 10% bar for this one of time unless there is you know there's something that has been confirmed before using any other technique or somebody is really suspicious that you know they feel that there is something that would be important there so yes so looking for the reality i have a doctor as a last step with the next slide that is uh frankly speaking i have not well into this at all but i would be happy to talk to people i mean i i don't have an experience in this uh, domain or with the genes in that uh, there certainly sequence data there uh, those usually are the ones which end up being poorly mapped or kind of chucked out as those unmapped region which typically what i have done in the pipeline is at least to the point that i am able to collaborate with somebody to really look into that i do not discard the risk on the bank file so the way it is is those are marked as or flagged as unmapped files they stay in the bank file uh, if i want to get back to them later and say somebody wants to really look into those genes then yes this data is available but i have not yet looked into any of those uh, areas in the genome yes i have a question about um <clears throat> at some point the cross comes down um is there a possible role for doing multiple sequencing ones on the same specimen or even something with the whole genome and something with the transcription of the patterns and the expression might be something to use for the an IHC pattern to try to localize changes spatially um yeah is something that could be long time away or you know these It seems like it's getting cheaper and cheaper on these specimens. Right. So I, I think it's a uh, there's a ideally yes that would be ideal to have your you know DNA sequence data how your transcriptome looks like and what your protein expression profile is based on you know some sort of uh, you know either IHC or FISH or you know looking at an in inside of hybridization techniques. Um, it really comes down to cost, expertise, and you know uh, how much that can be handled in terms of the infrastructure so uh, you know if you talk of for example st jude's okay 
everything from an exome to methylome to transcriptome, to you name what thing, you know, they do that. Uh, but they have a wealth of data that comes out of it, which you know they correlate and you know it makes a lot of sense. Um, but those are massive scale endeavors that you you know there's it's it's a lot of sequencing capacity. It's a lot of um, you know bioinformatics capability. It's a different scale of operation in terms of deploying those pipelines to be able to handle that in a in a reasonably in a reasonable turnaround time. Um, the other way to look at that is to to scale down look at very specific regions that are of clinical interest and so one of the things that we you know that we do in our uh, clinical lab is uh, with you know with uh, some of the assays that are done with ngs where uh, for example in the you know in the um, uh, thyroid or the brain panel we have a component that looks into dna mutation and we have a component that looks into uh, sp very specific genes in terms of expression or gene fusion and so sometimes that helps in terms of for example the classic example i usually give is with braf so there is if there is a braf mutation usually what we see you know in papillary thyroid carcinomas at least is uh, the met expression goes up very high and that's been a very consistent finding it makes biologic sense in terms of the pathway that you know braf sort of you know uh, drives or upregulates and so those uh, you know that's one example where it helps out uh, you know one of the the i think the greatest area of benefit in these things uh, doing an approach where you're doing um, you know you're looking at the dna and the rna as well is looking at uh, splice sites so looking at the impact of truncating mutations you know right now we assume that truncating mutations essentially would lead to loss of protein but really there's a lot of different mechanisms that occur it depends on the position of where the truncating mutation is and if the information is available for example there is an nf1 deep intronic mutation but when you look at the nf1 rna the rna essentially is shortened or just lost or the the expression or the quantity of rna is low that actually gives you a very convincing data saying that whatever you're seeing in the dna in terms of a mutation in nf1 is actually either impacting the splice site or affecting the trans, you know the uh, the transcription in a way that actually is down regulating nf1 which is you know important for many cancers so yes i mean uh, ideal yes in a reasonable very targeted fashion i think it's doable depending on the resources on a very large scale it really depends on you know uh, the the institution the money the amount to pour out the clinical utility i think that's the key question that most clinical space struggle with I mean, is it worth doing all that? Is it is it you know chasing after a real rare mutation in a patient with some you know some cancer? Would that really help? You know, at the end of the time, yes, you know that there is an NF1 mutation. Is that going to really help find a target treatment for that patient? Uh, that's that's where it comes to. So. I think uh, before I answer, uh, uh, the question. <laughs> <laughs>